From KGW, this is The Good Stuff. Tonight on The Good Stuff, Portland State University is getting a major cash boost to support art education at the school. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Tim Gordon. The $10 million donation comes from real estate developer Jordan Schnitzer. The idea, he says, is that the donation will reach beyond just the PSU campus and it helps revitalize downtown Portland. Here's KGW's Kyla Boshi with more. Portland real estate developer Jordan Schnitzer made a $10 million donation to Portland State University. The money will be used to sustain the free on-campus art museum that bears his name and help build a new home for the university's art and design school. Construction of the new school building on the southern edge of the South Park blocks is expected to begin this year with a grand opening in 2026. State bonds will also help pay for the project. My parents always taught me uh, too much is given, much is expected. The $10 million gift answers a call from Oregon Governor Tina Kotek to help revitalize downtown Portland. Last year, Kotek created a task force made up of business, community, and education leaders. It's not just about government solving the challenges ahead of us, because it's all of us. All of us coming together to solve the challenges that are facing us. Local leaders, including Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, hope the PSU campus will be seen as a downtown arts destination. You can no longer count on people having to be located in cities. Instead, you have to make people want to be located in cities. And I am a strong proponent of arts, culture, education, and commerce being the kinds of things that make people want to be in a thriving city. Kyla Boshi reporting there. Well, $1 million of the gift will help PSU improve its urban campus through better lighting and outdoor art. Well, whether it was for the OSU game or for Easter celebrations, the nice weather over the weekend provided even more incentive for people to get outside and visit local businesses across the Rose City. That includes the rooftop at Metropolitan Tavern near the Convention Center. The tavern was just one of many restaurants providing special Easter brunches. This was the third year holding this event since the pandemic shut things down. And the general manager says they had a healthy turnout. Everybody uh, enjoys coming here on a nice sunny day uh, for the views, the atmosphere, uh, you know, cocktails, everything. We love Portland. We love to be here, support the city. So we're out and about having a good time in Metropolitan Tavern. Come on down, have a drink with us. Well, the restaurant says they hold brunches like this for most major holidays, as well as Mother's Day. And a local nonprofit spent last week spreading Easter cheer to those less fortunate. And it culminated with a Sunday brunch at Union Gospel Mission's main location in Old Town. The mission started its Easter celebrations last week with a special holiday meal at its overnight shelter. With this brunch, they wanted to make a special event for people experiencing homelessness because many are separated from family and cannot have a typical family celebration. Knowing people by name, welcoming them, giving them just a greeting and helping them to know that they are seen and cared for. We've really enjoyed our volunteers do an excellent job of serving them through the day and just uh, kind of putting a special touch on Easter for them. Yeah, they do a great job there. The group also put together 500 food baskets so that struggling families in the community could also enjoy an Easter meal. Well, a Salem man recently reached a milestone. Listen to this, two decades in the making, he finished off the, his quest to run a half marathon in every state in the country. Jerry Corson started when he was nearly 50 years old, and along the way, he faced some pretty serious challenges. Art Edwards has his story. 73-year-old Jerry Corson ran the New York City half marathon on St. Patrick's Day, more than just a single race. It completed the goal of running a half marathon in every state. I knew it would get to that point. It just took a lot longer than I ever thought. The idea took shape in 2004. Gorson had already run some races, including hood to coast and even marathons, usually one vacation trip and two races at a time. Along the way, he chronicled his progress with pictures, holding up his hands at the end of a race to show how many he'd run. At home, there's a map with pins in it to mark each race but it wasn't a straight line. In between that, you lose a couple spots. My wife had cancer, that cost me some time. COVID 
cost three full years right there, and I had my health situation. That situation was glioblastoma, a type of brain cancer. I had uh, um, brain surgery in November of 22. That puts a stop on everything that you're planning in your life. You don't know how you're going to come out, if you're going to come out, or whatever. At that time, I still had five races left. Were you thinking at, at, along the way that, you know what, maybe this isn't going to happen? You think it, yeah. That's part of the thought process. But all you can do is put a foot forward and keep going. That's exactly what he did, continuing to race and continuing to put pins on the map. I feel healthy. I'm able to get out and get outside. So, But run where I used to? No. Speed is not an issue. Finish is an issue. On March 17th, Corson, along with more than 25,000 other runners, ran the New York City Half Marathon, greeted by the race director. It was, it was awesome and it's infectious. You're standing there at the finish line watching these people accomplish this goal that they set for themselves and then completing it that day. For Corson, the culmination of a goal established 20 years ago. I had both some sad regrets and some very happy regrets. But it's regrettable because for so long, every vacation or trip that we planned included a run or two. Now we're free to go wherever, whenever, and for whatever. He has all the medals to show for his efforts. Now they hang in the hallway of his home, along with all the race bibs. A reminder of what he accomplished. He says running helped him get through some of the toughest times. And had I not been in shape, had I been super overweight, or had I not been doing anything, I may not be sitting here. <laughs> Great story. Good for him. Well, stay with us, because next we take you not just through, but over an Oregon forest. The latest edition of Grant's Getaways coming up after the break. First, let's take you out to the Rose City Sky Cam. And oh, what a beautiful, are there any jellyfish clouds in there? We had jellyfish clouds earlier today. Looks just more like regular clouds, but still very beautiful over the Rose City. We'll be right back.
Well, just in time for a spring break getaway, Grant McComey takes us flying across southern Oregon. And we're not talking about a trapeze or even inside of a plane, but through and above an Oregon forest. Get ready to go zipping above the Rogue River Valley. the sound that gives it away. A high wire act that lets you soar across trees and leave all your troubles behind on the Rogue Valley zip line. All right, is this all of us? A ride that requires you gear up for safety. Once you make that loop larger, take your right hand, put it inside the loop, go over your head to your left shoulder. Steve Carlino and Katie Fox. Rock out. Show you the ropes, then lead you up the trail. Biggest rule of the day is to have fun, guys. Yeah! Where you get attached to zip number one. So you can touch from this bolt and behind any of the staples, the belay loops, the tethers. I'll even let you hold my hands. Yeah. Here we go! <laughs> it's 2,700 feet of high wire zip lines through and above scrub oak and pine in the arid climate of Jackson County, just outside Gold Hill in southern Oregon. We are now zipping above the canopy of the trees. So those views we were talking about are really going to start opening up. Speeds can reach more than 50 miles an hour. Well, you get ones who are nervous, right? They come out and they're like, I don't know if I want to do this. And they're, even on line one, they're like scared. And by the end, they're like, But I love it when they scream because I know that they're out of their comfort zone. I'm definitely trying something new. I know that I was out of my comfort zone the, when I first tried it, but when you are out of your comfort zone, that's when the amazing things happen. And I've been here ever since. Rogue Valley Zipline is brainchild of owner Lindsay Rice. She zipped her first wire in Hawaii, and as she flew through the air, she thought, We've got better views back in Oregon. So, six years ago, she built the Rogue Valley course across 83 acres with five zips. That was fabulous. The scenery out into the valley is spectacular. That's one of the best experiences I've ever had on a zip. Good job. Longest wire is more than a quarter mile long and takes advantage of something special. The views are absolutely beautiful. Look down across on top of Table Rocks. You can see Mount McLaughlin on most days and the rim of Crater Lake. I kind of almost wished you could stop in the middle and like hang out there for a little bit, <laughs> just check it out. Sounds yeah, like you'll do it again. Yeah, exactly. Oh, totally. Yes, yeah, so it was a lot of fun. And there's more. The Rogue Valley Zipline is open to everyone. It's ADA friendly because we do whatever we can to accommodate. Um, we have guests come out that are missing arm, arms and legs or are blind in wheelchairs. Even grandma who's in her 90s may want to go zipping with her, her grandkids. In Jackson County with photographer Jeff Kastner. It really allows for the whole family to be able to enjoy this fun activity together. Grant McComey, KGW. Ooh, that looks like fun too. And as always, if you want more information on this or any of Grant's getaways, Grant has everything you need to know on the Grant's Getaways page on KGW.com. Meanwhile, Portland Parks and Rec just unveiled photos of a new bike and pedestrian path leading up to Mount Tabor Park. Take a look at this. The path will give pedestrians and cyclists a dedicated route to the park from the South Tabor, Tabor neighborhood. You can hop on the trail near Southeast 64th and Division. And guess what? It's already open, so you can go hop on right now if you want. We'll wait till after the show. Thanks. Now coming up, meet a woman who's looking to empower women and make a quality cup of chai. Great story coming up.
Welcome back. While Women's History Month may technically be over, we're still celebrating women in our community as we should be every day. Well, today we are highlighting an Iranian American woman who launched her new chai business on International Women's Day last month. Christine Petawanich got a chance to try her chai and talk to her about the passion that fuels her. I have to try it before I share it with you. It's good. It's so good. Okay. Meet Masa Jarabi, a woman on a mission. Um, there's some rooibos in it, cacao, chaga mushroom, ashwagandha. All in a cup of her masa chai. I love the spices yeah. though too. Yeah. Her journey started as a little girl in Iran during the war with Iraq. This photo shows her, her mother and her siblings leaving Iran on a flight. It was her mother who taught her food and rituals. In this case, making a cup of tea can help you feel centered, connected, and get you through anything. During the pandemic, that mindset was pivotal. It was a rough time, right? A lot of anxiety in the house, and the thing that I'd always searched for when I needed comfort and peace is the ritual of like just having a cup of tea. It's so popular in our culture. But the caffeine was too much, and everything else she tried. You name it, I bought it fell short. I kind of felt really disappointed in the way we've defined chai in the U.S. I mean, most chai comes in a concentrate, and usually the first three ingredients are black tea and then water and sugar. But then in came inspiration. My husband was like, you're a chef. What are you doing? Like, make your own. That was a year ago, and after lots of tinkering, Masa Chai launched this month on International Women's Day. It was really important to me um, because the name of the chai is Master Chai. It is my name, but it's also a name that really represents kind of the fight for freedom. Um, you know, with the Women Life Freedom Movement, Masa Amini was killed for showing too much hair. As an Iranian woman who grew up in Iran, like I've, I know what it's like to not have freedom. My mother knows and her mother knows. And I really wanted this to represent the idea that we all deserve access to wholeness and freedom and wellness no matter who you are, but especially women. For this mother, three vivacious girls. Her chai is a symbol of what's possible. There's a lot of layers to it, but I want them to know that you can do anything if you have a belief in yourself and also if you have a support system. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. And now I want to try that chai. Well, after the break, we take you to Minnesota, where a construction worker really exemplified the saying, right place, right time. Details on how it saved his life when we come back. But first, we're going to take you outside to the Dalles. And that's Mount Hood, kind of shrouded in clouds, but you can see the orange glow behind that. I don't know if that's maybe not quite the alpine glow, but it's nice enough, isn't it?
Well, our final story here on The Good Stuff tonight is all about being in the right place at the right time. Now, it may sound cliche, but there's no better way to sum up the experience than what happened inside a Minnesota hospital. Boyd Hubert explains. When you work construction, your job takes you. All over the place, all over the place. Don Peabody helped build the Vikings Lakes Hotel and that new residential tower overlooking Target Field. Good. But five days before Christmas, fate put Don and his hard hat in the perfect place. He just said he didn't feel right. Andrew Gustafson was working with Don that day, too. We were doing the same thing. We were just starting to take down temporary walls around a, an area that we were working in down there. Doing construction here. And that's when my... Well, it was first my elbow started bothering me. My whole arm started to get numb, and then I had the chest pain. Andrew started looking at me. Yeah, you, know, you don't, you don't look so good. Do you feel all right? I was thinking stroke. Andrew grabbed a chair from a lounge. I was sitting there. Right place, right person. I was sitting at the charge desk, stood up and walked to the supply room, and there they were. Jody Sefcheck yep. has a nurse's intuition. He didn't look good. He wouldn't tell me he was having chest pain. He was talking about his elbow. She said, well, we don't we don't mess around with that. This is the same style. Jody snagged. Gone 10 seconds and Donna Rye. Back with the wheelchair. <laughs> she moves pretty fast. I'm a fast walker normally. That is one thing people joke about that I walk very fast. Walking fast, pushing Don in that wheelchair. Jody went straight to the emergency department and Dr. Gracie Gorman. So when I got the EKG initially, I knew it's a very classic pattern for a heart attack. That's the before picture. That's when I went in. That's where it was black, 100%, and that's after they cleared it. <laughs> it's like, wow, I guess I really did have something going on in there. A week and a half later, Don was back at Regents Hospital. Work. Is that raw edge over there too, Andrew? Everything with a heart attack is timing. So the sooner you can get evaluated, the sooner we can get you to a procedure to start saving that heart muscle. Don could have been at a different job site. Got it. Or at home, where he lives alone. So he was extremely fortunate to be here when this all happened. How you doing? Hi, Don. Hi. Don says Jody. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> is now his second favorite nurse. My daughter's a nurse. And, uh, very proud of her. As if Don needed to be reminded again of the gift yep. that is nurses. Sorry. Janie Peabody needs her dad around. She's getting married in January, next January. So I want to be there. Don will be there for Janie's next big occasion. Because first, he was here. I think it's pretty much etched, etched in my mind. When you work construction, Ready? you don't forget a project. It's good to have them back. Especially the one that saved okay. your life. I guess I saved all the luck of my life for that day. Like we said, right place, right time. So we're very happy for Don and for his daughter. And thanks to those awesome medical professionals for being there for him. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for making a little time for the good stuff. But before we go, we're sending you out to uh, a live look from the Wells Fargo Sky Cam over downtown Portland. Look at the sun out there in the distance hitting the, the land off past the river. We're also going to send you the reserve vineyards for a little sunset out that way as well. Have a great night, everyone.